Hello and welcome to Conversations with Achievers. And our achiever today is Adam Povitz. I'm going to have him introduce himself to you a bit. And Adam, from sunny Florida, tell us a little about you, your background, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Thanks, Robert. So yeah, I'm, I'm Adam Povlitz. I am the CEO and president of Anago Cleaning Systems. We are a three-tier commercial cleaning franchise company. Most of your listeners are probably familiar with a two-tier franchise company, McDonald's and the people who own the restaurants of McDonald's. Ours is unique in that it's tied to a three-tier model. So we have the corporate offices, which I'm the CEO of, and then we have what we call our master franchises. And then within the master franchises, we have what we call a unit franchise. And so to break that down for everyone, the master franchise, I think if you think of commercial cleaning, most people, when I say commercial cleaning, the image that comes into everyone's mind is like the guy with a vacuum or a mop in a bucket or something along those lines. And that's part of it. That's that's your unit franchise and their staff, right? The people who have to go out, clean the buildings, understand the chemicals and the equipment and hire the crews to, to get it done. And most commercial cleaning is done at night. So the question that kind of gets begged is who's doing the day job? And the day job, so to speak, is done by the master franchise. So the master franchisee would own like a greater metro area. They're really big territories. Like a, you're out in Colorado. The folks who own that area own the entire state of Colorado, as an example, as the master franchise in the state. We're actually in 48 major metro areas and or states across the U.S. and Canada as master franchises. And so that master franchise is handling the day job, so to speak, right? So they have, they're the one with the online presence, the local uh, website, the sales staff, customer service reps, and then also the accounting folks doing the billing and collections. So if you really think about it, what's unique is the synergy that our model creates, right? It's the master franchise is in the quote unquote cleaning business, but has zero people on staff that do any cleaning whatsoever. And the unit franchisee is in the cleaning business and has to have zero experience on the business side, has zero sales staff, zero accounting folks doing collections or anything like that on their behalf. So everyone saves a couple of bucks in their overhead and how they structure things. This place uh, of, of a franchise model in your own personal journey. Can, can you say that again, Robert? It broke up. Uh, I'm wondering... First of all, how long have you been doing this? How long, how long has the, the, the franchise model been in business? So we, the Anago, the brand has been around for 35 years, actually last month or yeah, about last month. So 35 year old brand. I've been with Anago going on 15 of those years. I've been since 2009. I got started, it, my father actually founded the business in 1989. I had absolutely no desire to get into the family business. And so he, it, it wasn't until 2009 that I, that I ended up coming aboard. But I was actually in corporate finance at the time. And I was at IBM. And in, in 2008, 2009, as everyone knows, the, the kind of the bottom fell out of the economy. And so there was this mass round of layoffs. And I, I actually wasn't laid off. I was one of the analysts who I was given employee numbers and I was working with a team to analyze who was getting the proverbial golden parachutes and the, and, the, and who wasn't. And it really left a, a really just sour taste in my mouth about the corporate world. And I go, I could just as easily have been on the other side of that table. And I was down for the holidays chatting with my dad and he goes, man, I think I got the tiger by the tail on this one. You got to come check out this Anago thing. And it was about six months later that I ended up joining Anago. And he goes, congratulations, you've left your highfalutin finance job. And your first job at Anago is you're going to be a telemarketer by day and a franchisee's assistant at night cleaning a daycare. And this was this was like before diaper genies and stuff like that, right? So this is imagine the 55 gallon drum garbage can filled to the brim with dirty diapers. And so it was a long day. I'd literally go to work, do all that, get hear all the no's and take me off your list as a telemarketer would all day. And then you change into your kind of cleaning uniform and you go out there and you get dirty diapers. So I, but I actually, that was, so I worked in the South Florida master franchise as well as supported one of its unit franchises for that for a while. And I did everything. I did inside sales, outside sales, customer service, 
And then ultimately it was after a, a training program, if you will, where I went through literally everything in the master franchise, the roles in there, I moved to the corporate office and then began traveling the country. I think I was, I think it was just called a franchise developer or some kind of vague title like that. But, the, but basically my job was traveling the country, meeting with the master franchisees. And at the time I'm probably late twenties, so I'm a young kid. And, and so my only real thing that I could bring to the table when I would meet with these franchisees who'd have been in business for 10, 12 years, whatever it may be, is I, I had to take this servant leadership approach of what can we do for you? Like, how can I, how, I'm here, how can I help you? And so I kind of, I feel, I'd like to think I've, I've taken that approach now that I've climbed the ranks and went up to, it was 2015 that I was promoted to president and 20, I think it was 2018 that the, the officially made it CEO and president. And the former president, when he retired and passed the mantle, he got me a business card holder. And I look at it and it says P-U-D-S-O-B-I-C. And I'm like, what the heck is, what does this even mean? And he goes, it stands for poor, unfortunate, dumb SOB in charge. <laughs> so I was like, thank you. I, I appreciate the trust. <laughs> well, extra inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> is your father so, still active in the business no he hasn't been active he probably wasn't active since around 2018 and he actually passed in 2023 but he was he would show up every day and we say he would rustle papers and ruffle feathers but he hadn't actually been actively involved since about 2018 sounds like he puts you out on the line doing the work at, at every level really early which sounds like a brilliant frankly, brilliant strategy and, and a loving gesture. I, I think it added some credibility too, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who come into second generation businesses. And if the second generation has been ha handed the, the keys on a silver platter, it shows <laughs> versus a second generation being, I was more baptized by fire than handed any particular set of keys. And I think that's that's a big difference maker saying that very few problems come to you that you haven't uh, had some experience with on the line. A deeper understanding from actually having done it, not just reading about it in a book or going to a seminar. Right, exactly, exactly. Wow. Uh, the, that story about the 55-gallon drum of diapers, <laughs> that'll stay with me for a while. <laughs> wow, Lovely. wonderful. What did you what do you what have you found that you had to learn in becoming a, a a CEO? And even though it's a kind of a family business, uh, you really had to work your way up. The role changes, of course, when you're at the top of the game as opposed to a middle manager or or different roles within the company. What yeah. have you noticed in your own personal journey? What came up for you? Two things that really impacted my experience. I, I think there's a difference. And, and in around 20, 2021, let's call it, it was about maybe yeah, 2021, I, I realized there's a difference between someone who runs a family business and someone who's looking to grow an enterprise. And for me, I looked at it and I said, okay, this is this business does well. I've helped it grow and it was, it was growing before I got here and it's growing, pat on my back, it's growing faster now. And this could be something I do and this is my job and this is my job forever, so to speak. I get a lot of small business owners. There's no shame in it. There's nothing wrong with it. A lot of people go, I want to, this is, I'm a small operation and I want to stay that orientation or I want to scale this thing. I want to see how big this thing can go, how high the elevator can go before I decide to get off. And I ended up, maybe it's just how I'm hardwired at this point, but I ended up taking the option door number two there. And so I, I learned two things in that process. One, um, I was always, I was never, frankly, I was never very good at hiring, particularly at the, the senior levels. I actually read a book called Who. It was actually recommended by the, the pastor at my church. They were growing really fast. And I go, hey, you've hired some great people as you've grown super fast. And I go, granted, your mission and your goals are a little bit more lofty than mine. <laughs> but I go, Can you, what, what did you do? And he said, I read this book called Who. It's by Jeff Smart. And it gives you a blueprint on exactly how to put together the job description, how to, what interview questions to ask, what order to ask them in. And it took me from being 
somewhat afraid, for lack of a better word, of hiring really senior people because it's like, what do I ask? What do I know about, I don't know, hiring an IT director or something like that? I don't know anything about it. To where I, I felt completely comfortable. I could, I, I could interview for any role in any company and I'm completely comfortable with it. And by doing that, I ended up, I'm still, I'm always looking to continually professionalize management here. But in about a two-year period, I ended up hiring about 12, 12 new people, eight of which were senior, like senior leadership roles. And when you start going from family, the family runs things to we have professional managers, it things, growth numbers and stuff like that start exploding. It's just a totally different trajectory that you're on when you start thinking like that. And the second thing was, and this came probably from COVID, that every business really needs a really a, a clear vision. I think coming up as a servant leader, I, a lot of my early CEO days were very much, I say I fumbled my way forward as CEO. I just, I, I read a lot of leadership books, gone to a lot of conferences. I had never been a CEO before, but I learned on the job and we did well. But I realized during COVID, when you're on the phone with your entire franchise system once or twice a week saying, here's what's going on. Here's where things are at. Here's where you can get these chemicals from. Here's how you get your PPP money and, and so on. People are really, truly looking for someone to, particularly in a franchise system, to really take the bull by the horns and help drive and, and be their part in the process. But they're not looking to be that person who's casting the vision in the direction. That's why they bought the franchise. They're looking to execute. And so throughout that process, I realized that was something absolutely crucial that we had to do. And after things settled down, finally, I sat with my with my, my management team. And I said, what are some things we could do? And we created what we called the $100 million challenge. And at the time, <clears throat> this was beginning of 2021, we were a, a roughly a $60 million brand in recurring revenue. We were big, don't get me wrong. But I said, I want to be a $100 million brand over just over 80% growth or so there. And I said, I, and I, but I want to do it in 24 months. Um, and we laid out a, a five prong plan on how we were going to attack it and what we were, were going to do to get there and got promoted it like absolute mad to our franchise system. And that's all we talked about at our conferences and everything like that. And we ended up doing it in 19 months. Um, and part of me goes, shoot, I should have said 120, like <laughs> should have set the bar even higher, but it was amazing to be able to do, to achieve such a huge milestone and ahead of schedule. And again, now I don't know if this is brains or balls or stupidity or what, but so then at the last conference, I stuck my neck out and I said, and now I want to be a $300 million brand. And I want to do that within the next five years. So we're calling that our vision 2028, which is to be a, to triple revenue now uh, again. So we almost just about short of doubled it. Now I want to triple it again. And that's a totally different path than what it took to get from zero to 60, 60 to a hundred, and now a hundred to 300. It's another level. It's another world that we're operating in, in terms of just how efficient, how structured, how much infrastructure is needed underneath to support everything. But it's exciting. It's a wild, it's a wild journey here. And those would, I would say those would be my two real key takeaways is, is don't be afraid to hire and everything, everyone needs a clear vision. Incredible growth and challenging to achieve. So time to celebrate, <clears throat> at least in this little moment between you and I, as to say, uh, I hope you're enjoying it and that hat on the shoulder is well-deserved. Uh, when you launched into that, realizing that you wanted to grow and, and maximize the potential of your business. Were there people that you had to say goodbye to? People that had been there for a while and were probably doing an okay job in the old structure and the old way of doing business. Did you have to start fresh in, in some areas? In some instances, there, there was, there's, I'm someone who's very anti having to let go of people if I can avoid it. I, I, I'm very big on, okay, is there another role we can fit this person into? Is there something else we can try? I believe if we if we took the time and the resources to interview them and hire them, then it's our job to make it fit. There, there are inevitably some times where someone is not a fit. I can't think of a lot. We went out of our way to let go of maybe one or two. 
we did have during the during it was probably end of 2021 the what do they, they call it the great resignation we definitely had we definitely got we had used to i'm used to people sticking around anago for eight ten i have i have two people one that is at 30 years and one's going to be at 30 years next spring and so you just you don't hear of that in companies anymore i think our culture is generally pretty good but we had and we got bit by the bug and the res the great resignation bug and had to had to replace the bulk of the marketing department. It was actually me and one of the lady who I who was at who's at 30 years this year. We it was it was down to the bare bones to where she and I were the ones like proofing newsletter copies together. And I said, man, I will never get caught that flat footed again. And since then I've hired now I have a marketing team of five people with a vice president over them. And it's everyone kind of has a role that they're is their core focus. And they, they could, they're all jacks of all trade. They're all phenomenal. Um, but they, they have a core focus that is their area of expertise. And I will say just as a general rule of thumb now looking forward, I think it's important to be honest and not try to try to make a square peg fit into a round hole forever. That's probably something I did as well. I think the effort has to be made looking out at the next year, two years, three years, five years, I, I'm sure there are going to be people, I hope not many, but I'm sure there's going to be a one or two people that where it's just no longer a fit and where culture is everything. And I think it was, I think it was Nick Saban, famous Alabama head coach. He said something along the lines of high achievers don't like mediocre people and mediocre people don't like high achievers. And, and so what you find is if someone, if we're trying to create a culture of high achieving, a high achieving group here, you bring someone in who's more mediocre, mediocrity focused or comfortable with mediocrity, it brings the whole room down. And so I would say I would be, I always try to make it work, but I would be faster to move on because I really, I think I, I want to keep this culture that we've developed. And I know it's, you got to handle it with kid gloves sometimes to make sure that it stays and, and doesn't shatter. Sorry, each strategy for breakfast has been attributed to many people including Peter Drucker. So I'll, I'll use Drucker as, as at least I have a, I had a direct experience with Peter Drucker. So I'll say that he wrote it, but that idea that what comes first is culture. It's not the urgency of what comes at you every day as a leader in a company. It's uh, looking beyond that to what are we really up to here and how do we want it to feel? Uh, the definition that, that I came up with years ago for, because people say define culture. And for me, it's the way things get done around here. And it's very values-based. And some jobs really work for people. And others, it's, it is that square peg in the round hole. It's just never quite right. And uh, one of the things I learned actually from my former wife was that when you sit down for that difficult conversation with somebody that's not a fit, is to realize that there is someplace else for them that does fit, where they can live a productive, fulfilled life. Right. That's where it's going to work for everybody. And, and developing that kind of win, even on the way out the door, is a really valuable part of culture because how you treated that person and how you help them in, in their next step telegraphs a message to everybody else. It's a, it's a very subtle and very powerful aspect of, of building a strong culture in, in my experience. Yeah. Uh, I like that reluctance that I noticed that you have. Let's look for a way to make this work. I think that's something that many leaders forget, or maybe they knew it, but they're not practicing it. Let's have this work for everyone, including me, the owner. Yeah, I think I think if you look at culture, and yes, things are different for my my schedule, for example, as a CEO. I'm not nine to five. My Sometimes I stroll in at 10, but sometimes I'm working until 10 p.m., and so there's a certain things where as CEO, I should get different flexibilities because I'm working crazier hours. And then other things you go, I just want to everyone to know that I'm treated the same. And how would I want to be treated if I was let go? If the board came in and said, hey, we're going to move on from you. It wouldn't be like clear out your desk. It would be like, hey, here's what we need to evaluate. Let's take our time on this. Let's maybe, maybe there's a, some sort of package to get me on my feet again. And so then when we do have to go that route, it's reluctantly and giving someone an off-ramp versus a, a plank. 
sounds like you've uh, set up a learning environment there. Uh, have you done anything special in terms of your own learning? You mentioned you've gone to some conferences and, and certainly that book, that excellent book that really has contributed. What are you doing to take care of you? So I am an avid reader. I have my my uh, assistant from, gosh, five, six years ago. I would quote, I would always quote some book or something or say something I was reading. She goes, you know what? You need to get a bookshelf in your office and I'll help you build it all out and everything like that. So that's a, I, I'm an avid reader. I'm, I, I joke with my wife because she reads, I joke and I say, they're all basically variations of Fifty Shades of Grey. They're all just fiction, lady fiction with whatever those types of books with the romance. And I'm like, ah, for me, the only things I can read, I don't read anything fiction. I'm in like the business and self-help and the, those types of sections that, that you know, that, that, that part for me, I don't know. It's just the only thing that, that interests me. So I'm always reading. And from, I guess, from an, a mental and physical health, I'm someone who exercises regularly. I'm, I'm someone who tries to, this is something I've been doing lately as I've been reading the labels on food. Good God, don't do that. Because then you find out half of it's like partially hydrogenated soybean oil. And so I've been trying to eat more natural foods. I do one of those things that, that what are those called? Those like health optimization, where you get your blood tested every three months, six months, and I'm on... I got I got more pills than Jimmy Carter did, man. I got I got, I I take all sorts of vitamins and supplements, and I for me it seems to work. Keeps you sane, and so that you have a keeps everything inside working like it should. And then you go exercise and blow off some steam, and then and then you have your next day at the office and build up the steam again. <laughs> I think uh, uh, taking care of you is at many different levels, physically, mentally, emotionally, is key to leadership in these challenging times. Uh, yeah. Have you done the, the routine where they can, that kind of advanced blood testing where they can tell you your strengths and weaknesses in terms of your nutritional counts? Uh, yeah. That, yeah. That's something I have not done and that's on my list. Uh, I, I want to start, I want to get a doctor that does that and I haven't found that yet, but I'm, I, I know there are resources. Uh, I yeah, I did one and it does, it tests for if you have any genetic mutations, there's six genetic mutations that 30% of the population has one of them. I found mm -hmm. out I had one of them. It's nothing that you would even think of, but it's something that you, you live your life on and you don't even think about it. And so like my, both my mother and father had high blood pressure. I've been on, I was on blood pressure medication for 20 years. I take this test. It says, basically I have this genetic deficiency or whatever where my body doesn't process some i think it's called like homocysteine in the blood fast enough and they go oh here's all here's all you take is these b supplements like a b complex and a it's called tmg or something like that and it's all stuff you can buy on amazon i, I was like okay of course there's the place i did the blood test at they're selling their product and i go hey, i'll go on i'll go online and find it for cheaper within two months of taking this, these stuff that you could buy on Amazon every day, I got off all my blood pressure medication. And so it's, yeah, it's amazing what you can, what you could find out what your body really needs and versus pumping yourself full of the pills that I did for 20 years of blood pressure medication. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I never needed that. I just needed a few vitamins and what do you call them? Not electrolytes, but the amino acids. You know that the technology has advanced to the point where they can tell you so much about your body and my body. And that's what I want to do. I want to get more information. And you can buy every supplement in the health food store, but it, it would be better to target <laughs> that's the whether one it's the gen genetic mutation or some bad habits. And so these expert people can be more specific and help in that way. That's great. Uh, Adam, uh, first of all, uh, Later, I'm going to get your address because I want to send you a copy of my book. Uh, but uh, if people want to get be in touch with you, either as a prospective franchisees, either at master or unit levels, or just uh, to contribute to you or for you to contribute to them, what's the best way for people to be in touch with you? We obviously our website's a good place for anyone on the looking for the franchise side. It's anagocleaning.com. That's A-N-A-G-O cleaning.com. 
we're on all the social media and everything's Facebook slash Anago Cleaning, Instagram slash Anago Cleaning. And then I'm very active on LinkedIn. So if you just look up Adam Pavlitz on LinkedIn and shoot me a message, I'll be sure to respond. Hey, thanks for everything. I have a feeling we could do two or three shows and uh, dig a little deeper in some things. So maybe we'll talk about that later. It's yeah. been a real contribution. I know that for sure. I know my listeners will appreciate it whatever it is that we've chatted about today. Thank you sincerely. I, I wish you every possible happiness and success and stay away from those school-born bugs. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Say, Adam, thanks so much. Thank you.